Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to introduce Rakesh Mande. He did his PhD in Aryabhata Research Institute of Observational Sciences in Nanital, India. <laughs> then he did his first postdoc in the Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad, India. Yeah. And his second postdoc is the one he has here in the GAPA postdoc. He has already completed his first year of the, the GAPA postdoc, and today he will tell us about his results during this time. Thank you. Hello, very good morning. Uh, so, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, infrading phase of the initial evolution of massive stars called the protein phase, which has been predicted in many theoretical works but not has been explored in the observations very well. I'm going to uh, show some of the results from our recent study, which tests the protein star hypothesis in a massive young star object IRAS 19520 plus I'm also going to show some of the preliminary results from the follow-up study of the source with Alma. So let's start. Sorry. Okay. So as we know, so Yeah. As you know that massive stars are formed right, formed in this half filament kind of structure, that these half activating material from this filaments are the overdense structures and are the blood phase of the massive star. And this uh, cartoon diagram depicts the variation, various phases of the uh, uh, evolution of the massive star, taken from the review article of Motet on 2003. So uh, uh, a distancing factor, which uh, a factor which distances the massive star formation from its lower mass counterpart is the higher mass, mass accretion rate. And as we know that massive stars have short Kelvin amount at time scale, and they evolve very fast, so we can about five years, and that puts a lower limit on the accretion rate, like ten to the power minus four solar mass per year for a thirty mass solar jet. And several, in several observational works also, we have derived, uh, people have derived efficient rates greater or equal to 10 to the power minus solar mass per year or greater than that. So several theoretical works are studying the initial evolution of massive star with such, with at, at such high efficient rate and predicted that the massive stars would grow out, swelled up during the evolution phase. And this kind of bloating is found to be a robust feature of the, the protostar evolution. Uh, it does not depend on the, uh, the accretion geometry and which is independent of the accretion geometry and the adopted initial model. So the increased radius due to those results in a lower effective temperature and lower, uh, lower luminosity of the MYSO. So there are two observational properties which are critical to consider an object as a bloated star candidate. Centimeter emissions will enter than expected because those has lower uh, UV luminosity and the spectral type greater than expected, even its usual uh, major luminosity because this source has lower effective temperature. Now, uh, Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so as we know that uh sorry, it's not moving here. <laughs> so as you know that the opacity inside the stellar interior can be described from this for trans relation and the as the addition proceeds, the gradual decrease in the opacity inside the stellar interior which could cause variety in the evolution. And this swelling is considered as one of the four evolutionary phases of the protostellar accretion. And since the, uh, with the higher accretion rate, the gas has higher specific entropy. And since the initial phase, the, uh, we have like very high opacity inside the stellar interior. So it allows the efficient accumulation of the entropy inside the stellar interior. As the entropy goes, uh, as the opacity goes down, the outward, the gradual outward transport of this entropy you know, into a thin layer of the 
Visceral surface caught it to bloat up or swelled up. And after the opacity goes sufficiently down so that uh, the uh, heat can, uh, if it's energy can tra transmit via uh, radiation efficiently, the star starts to contract. And as the star starts to contract, the pressure and the temperature start to increase, and the hydrogen burning starts in the, in, the, in, the, in the center and the start, the start enters into the uh, main sequence equation phase. So, this kind of a variation in the stellar uh, radius as the sorry uh, the, the the variation in the stellar, uh, the variation in the radius of the star as the in, as the the accretion proceeds uh, can be uh, shown by this figure which is taken from the Boskawa and Umupe 2009 and you can see in the so this this figure uh, shows the variation in the radius. With the marks with different accretion rate, like starting from 10 to the power minus 4 solar mass per year to the 4 into 10 to the power minus 3 solar mass per year. And you can see that, like in, in, in every accretion rate, you can see like a floating kind of uh, feature, and after that, the case contraction. So, this kind of uh, phenomena is shown by Hoskawa uh, and Umupi in 2009. And in this plot, the Volumetric luminosity of the MOI source is plotted against the radio continuum luminosity of the sources. So you usually see like this kind of feature, like with the higher volumetric luminosity, you see like higher centimeter uh, emission. But for some of the sources, like here, the red sources, despite, despite having like higher, higher, very high volumetric luminosity, like 10 to the power 5, 5 solar luminosity, they have like very low centimeter emission. So, Lumsden et al. 2013 attributed this kind of phenomena could be due to the bloating of the MOI source. Now, another uh, uh, insight regarding the bloated phase of the MOI source comes from the theoretical work of Inayoshi et al. 2013. Yes. So, they have studied the, uh, they have formed the linear stability analysis on the protostellar efficient models of Boskawa and suggest that the star become persistently unstable during the growth phase. And the authors noted the Kappa mechanism, famously known to explain the variability in CPIT kind of variables and other kind of pulsating star as the, as the cause of the instability. So here I have shown this diagram taken from the, uh, I have taken this figure taken from the NASU et al. 2013. Here you can see like different uh, accretion models of, from the Puskova et al. with the different accretion rate starting from 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power minus 3. So the mass per year, the thick black line shows the PL relation. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that they have derived this uh, period to luminosity relation based on their work, which is given by this equation. So in this diagram, this black thick line represents the PL relation given by this equation. This shaded area shows the stability in strip and, and the models of Boskova et al. And uh, you can see like here that the, the, the stability, stability strip is only shown for, for uh, the accretion rate 10 to the power minus 3 or greater than that because the author, uh, because in their work they found that uh, uh, see, although the, the models are becoming unstable for uh, accretion rate greater than 10, less than 10 to the power minus 3 solar mass per year. But since the perturbations are taking too much time to grow, so they are not getting stellar pulsation from uh, for uh, accretion rate less than e to the power, uh, 10 to the power minus 3 solar mass per year. So they explain the periodic variability found in the MESAR sources with this PL relation. They invoke the argument that the MESAR sources are radiationally pumped by the protostar and, and any variability in the protostar itself could cause variability in the mesar sources and we know that mesar sources 6.7 gigahertz mesar sources are associated with the initial evolution of the massive star and they they uh, explain the periodic variability found in those sources with this pair relation so in this diagram the boxes these these boxes and the triangles are the sources are the mesar sources and uh, you can see that uh, this uh, the relation quite uh, fits well with this, the variability found in the MESAR sources. But the interesting point is that the boxes in this figure 
represent the source which are not associated with any ultra compact test region or any radio continuum emission while these triangle sources are associated with the with the ultra compact s2 region or they have some significant amount of UV, uh, centimeter emission associated with it so the pl relation well explain the sources which are not associated with the with the centimeter emission so could be bloated star candidate so uh, the pl relation has only been uh, contrasted obviously with methanol vessel variability and tested tests based on optical and infrared variability have not been carried out so far so in the past some of the the objects has been have been classified as a as a broken star candidate but none of them has been tested for the theoretically predicted theoretical variability such type of a source is iras uh, 19520 plus 2759. So this source is uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is 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 lies near the uh, supernova ribbon end. And uh, initially it was recognized as the OSI star. Later the fire for infrared study and SED analysis revealed the source to be an the uh, MYSO. And the distance of the source is somewhere between eight to eight to nine kpc. So it's, it's a bit far. And here I have shown some of the images of this target. Here is this, this, this is the target. This is the uh, some little bit of clump associated with the target. So the interesting thing about this source is it has a very fairly bright optical counterpart, and the stance of the, the optical counterpart is also somewhere between 8 to 9 kpc. And uh, the spectral type of the optical counterpart, uh, sorry, the volumetric luminosity of this source is somewhere like 10 to the power 5 solar luminosity. So it's like one of the brightest, so brightest MOISO. And the optical counterpart has a spectral type somewhere between 09 to earlier B1 type. So it, it's, it is a bit later if you compare it with the, with the volumetric luminosity of this source. The spectral type we expect with this volumetric luminosity is some, somewhere like 05 or 05, 04 or 05, something like that, but it's a bit later. And uh, the multi-wavelength study of this source performed by Balao et al. 2013 identified the source to be in an active accretion phase with a collimated outflow associated with it. So considering the this uh, and sorry, and this is the so this is the uh, the, the outflow uh, in this diagram the outflow associated with the target is shown, and there is no centimeter emission associated with this target. So considering the property of the optical counterpart, the luminosity of the source, uh, not having significant centimeter emission associated with it, the uh, efficient property of the sublimited source, they uh, suggest that this could be a bloated star candidate. So what we did, we uh, tried to <coughs> press the so yeah, here I have to uh, stop. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Here are some like optical uh, the properties of the optical counter <coughs> that I have mentioned. This source has luminosity of ten to the power five solar luminosity. One of the brightest source in the room, Spain at all, two thousand thirteen MOS catalog. The optical counter part is bit bright with a G magnitude of 14.9 and visible as a point like source in the HST images. So here is the HST image of the target. And the op it is about the spectral type, which is 0.9.5 or earlier B type, as I told. So this is the properties of the, the optical counter part. So we test the, the booted star, star hypothesis by checking the by uh, verifying the pulsation model for this, this source. For that, we have used the optical data from TJO, which is a, a, a robotic telescope in Spain in RC and IC bands. And we also use the data, archival data from surveys like Gaia, TAS, and NeoWise. So in the upcoming slides, I am going to show some of the results from the variability analysis. So, so yeah, so we did the usual procedure of cleaning the image, doing the photometry and determining the, the, the magnitude of the source and generating the differential light curve of the source. So here I have shown the differential light curve of the source in RC band and here is in IC band. So 
we have taken like two two cup capacitance stars c1 and c2 such that that standard deviation between c1 and minus c2 is minimum for the whole observation time so here is the differential uh, light curve of the source like source minus the comparison star one and this is the uh, source minus comparison star two they are like bit similar like almost similar and this is for the similar for the ic band the source minus comparison star one and comparison stars two and we see like systematic variation in the light curve of the source. So we try to identify any potential variable the variability associated with the source. So for that, we perform the long scale period diagram analysis to determine any potential period of the source. So in this diagram, I have shown the long scale periodic diagram showing uh, powers of the showing power spectrum of the source uh, with the period. So here you can see like uh, the highest peak. Is lies close to around 270 days plus minus 43, 43.08 days. And similarly for the IC band, it is 270 days plus minus 45 days. So these periods are like, are like similar in both bands, RC band and IC band. And then we overplotted this period in the light curve of the source. So these two diagram is for the RC band and these two diagrams for the IC band. So here I have overplotted the, the period of 270 days over the light curve source in RC band. Here is the phase folded diagram of <laughs> plotted, over plotted with the, the period. Similarly, here I have shown it for the IC band over plotted in the uh, light curve and here is the phase folded light curve. So, so you can see like the uh, the period nicely fits with the, the variation in the source and it's like with sinusoidal. So you can see like, uh, you can say that the period is quite significant. Similarly, we also did the analysis uh, of the light curve in the Gaia band because the source is observed in the Gaia band also. So here I have shown uh, the same uh, power spectrum of the source in Gaia G band. You can see here like two periods. Uh, this period is the highest peak is lies around 457 days and the second peak lies around 249 days. Similarly, for the RP band, you can see uh, the, uh, the, uh, the highest peak is around 440 days, and the second best peak is around 244 days. So interesting is uh, uh, interesting point is that the second peak is the, the second best period is a bit similar to the period we obtained in the PGO data, and it is uh, it is uh, necessary to mention that we couldn't retrieve that that period of 450 days from the TGO data because the total observation time for the TGO is something like somewhere around 450 days or something like that. And so it is not possible to retrieve this period from the TGO data. And uh, for the, the BP band, you can see like the errors in the in the in the light curve is quite high compared to the magnitudes. So we couldn't retrieve same kind of period in the, the BP, BP band. So here is the similar diagram as uh, shown for the G band. So you can see that the light curve is uh, the, sorry, the, sorry, the best period of 450 days is, uh, is over quoted over the light curve. Here is the, four, the best period is shown with the 450, day, uh, 450 days with the blue curve. And the second best period of 250 days is shown with the, the red curve. Here is the phase folded light curve with the best period of 450 days and it is with the second best period. So here you can see the, the best period quite tight, nicely fits the, the variation in the light curve. The second very best period is not that sinusoidal and it departs from the sinusoidal fork pattern. And you can see that, that this period of 457 days looks, looks better in the Gaia band analysis. Similarly, for the uh, the RP band also, uh, this is the light curve in the RP band overcoated with the best period of 40 days. And here you can see the comparison of best period and the second best period. Best period is shown with the blue curve and the second best period is shown with the red curve. Here is the phase folded diagram, phase folded diagram with the best period of 40 days. And this is the phase folded diagram with the second best period. Here also you can see the best period looks more significant and looks better. So with the Gaia band analysis, you can say that the, the best period of 457 days uh, looks better if you compare it with the second best period. We also tried to estimate uh, the period of the source uh, from the test data. And 
Maybe it's a Wi-Fi connection. Uh, he has the, uh, the direct line, so it should work. No, it's not, it's the way they mentioned. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe switch that off. No, you have the direct line, no? Is, it, is that not working? Yeah, the going to work. So if you switch Wi-Fi, it should, it should yeah. automatically. Maybe I should. I have to use the okay. Wi-Fi. Okay. The other thing is to. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. So you switch the Wi Fi off. Yeah. Maybe that. Maybe it's not well. Something with the Wi Fi connection. No, this direct line should work, but it's very. Really Looks like it is. It's flipping. So they should drop the Wi Fi. No, leave the Wi Fi. <laughs> now I should try sharing it. Well, it's not connected. You're still connecting. Mm -hmm. No, actually, you're. I have to go through the Zoom again? Yes. You're sharing your. You see? Okay. Okay. So, as the source is also observed from the test, we try to estimate the any potential period in the test type of also. And the source is observed in the test from different sectors, in different sections like 41, 54, 55, and 74, and 75. We combine the life curve in the all sector and try to determine the any potential period. So in the test analysis, we got a period of 6.2 days uh, from the uh, the by combining the life curve and that by doing the, the same uh long scale gate period analysis, we got the period as 6.02 days. And we also tried to Obtain any potential period of the source in the neowise life curve. So, so neowise observes the observes the source in the in the mid infrared band, like 3.6 micron or 4.5 micron. So we try to estimate the uh, any potential period associated with the source with the neowise data. So here is the light curve of the source in the W1 band, which is 3.6, maybe uh, 3.6 micron, and W2 is 4.5 micron. So here I have shown the light curve of the source in, in the W1 map. So, so in the in the neowise light curves, you usually get like multiple observations in a single epoch. So, so the usual process procedure is to, to like take a median on average to get a single point in a single epoch. So we did that. So we found uh, so then the median light curve is plotted with the right, uh, red, color, red color here. Similarly, for the W2 uh, band, you see the gray points are the all the data points, while the, the color data points are the median median data point. Here is the comparison between the W1 band and W2 band, and this is the variation of color with the, with the time. So we also uh, perform like long scale power analysis, and there is no significant period associated with the source has been found. So although although the source is is variable in the neowise data, uh, but we didn't find found any we didn't find any uh, significant period in the in the neowise data. So the after that the color variation. So color variation of the source is is widely used to like dif differentiate among the various plausible explanation of the variability in the source. So for that we have plotted the magnitude of the source with the color, with the magnitude of the source in G band and the color with like BT minus RT. And this is the magnitude with the time, and these data points are colored with the uh, with uh, 
uh, with the corresponding colors. So here you can see the this line shows the exchange vector of 0.2 magnitude in G band. So you can see like the color goes in the the color uh, the CMD diagram, this color and magnitude diagram, color and magnitude diagram shows the negative flow in the C CMD opposite to the the extension variation vector. So the source is getting a uh, uh, source is getting a uh, fainter as it is getting bluer. And similar kind of trend we obtain in the, in the DOI data also. This is the W2 band versus the color. This is the W1 band uh, versus the color. And these pay dots are the all the data points. And these color dots are the median data points, as I told in the previous slide, because we are interested in the longer period. So we, we took like these color data points for the fitting. We did uh, the orthogonal distance regression method to determine the slope of the, this, this fitting. So we found the slope of the this fitting is like minus 45 degrees. And in this W1 band, it, it is almost like similar. There is no trend in color variation. So this kind of color, uh, so we found like the source is getting fainter as it as it is as the source is getting bluer in the new wise as well in the optical data. So the question is uh, does the PL relation holds for I I one nine five two zero? So this is the period uh, luminosity relation given by you know, Ashu et al. two thousand thirty. Considering the luminosity of volumetric luminosity of the source as ten to the power five uh, solar luminosity, the period comes out to be uh, two forty four days. Now we have identified two periods. One is of the order of two forty two to seventy days with an error of 20 to 50 days. And the second period, which is a bit longer period of 440 to 460 days with an error of 70 to 80 days. So we have plotted this, this uh, period in this diagram, the PL relation diagram. These are the these, um, squares and triangles are the measure sources, as I as I discussed in the previous slide. Here is the red color shows the, shows the period of 240 to 470 days while the green color shows the period of 440 to 460 days. So you can see that the red color is quite consistent with the, with the peer relation, while the green color is matching the distribution of the Mesar sources. So one thing I, I forgot to mention Ed, is that the, the, the departure of this, uh, this sources uh, from the exact peer relation, like although the trend is like similar, but they are like the period in Mesar sources is a bit higher than the the predicted by P evaluation. So it is it is it is suggested to be, be due to the deviation from the spherical geometry. Like for the uh, for the disk geometry, you could you could see the period which are a bit larger than the, the period P evaluation. So our green points matches well with the with the P evaluation obtained in the Mesar sources. So uh, uh, it could be concluded that the the period of 440 to 460 days which is consistent with the prediction of the disk accretion rate, disk accretion K is, is more suitable for the for this source. And also the color variation we obtain in our analysis is, is very consistent with the, with the pulsation model because in the pulsation also you, you get like a negative slope in the CMD. So this color variation is also consistent with the pulsation model. The period obtained are also consistent with the, uh, the PL relation. So uh, we could uh, say that the, this could be a plausible scenario for the for the variability in this source, but we could not dis, uh, regard the other plausible explanation of the variability in, in, in MOI source. For that, uh, I'm going to discuss about the plausibility of other feasible scenarios to, predict, uh, to explain the variability in this source in the next slide. So there are other, uh, so yeah, I, I forgot to mention about this slide. So the authors also given like the you know, initial at all 2013, they've also given equation to determine the mass radiation and mass equation rate of the source uh, with, the, with the period of the source, dependence on the period of the source. So putting the value of the period as 270 plus minus 50 days, we get the mass of the source as 23 solar mass radius is around 650 solar radius and mass equation rate is around 6.5 into 10 to the power minus 3 solar mass per year for the value of period as 460 plus 80 days which is the higher period we obtain the mass of the source as 27 solar mass 
radius is around 1000 solar radius and uh, mass equation rate is around uh, 10 to the power minus 2 solar mass per year. So these are the physical parameters of the source. So I was talking about the... May I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, if the radius is so large, mm -hmm. how is that consistent with an 9.5 or early B spectral time? Yeah, because the temperature, because of the large radius, the effective temperature is low of the source. If, if the luminosity is 10 to the 5, mm -hmm. if it was 9.5, um, and that radius, the luminosity would be far, far higher. Yeah, but yeah, that's true. But uh, considering the error in the, in the, in the uh, radius estimation, like its radius could be like 650 solar radius, and in the uh, 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 the uh, for this case, it's around 1000 solar radius. So, what happens in the loaded phase, you get like higher radius, but after that, you get like a gauge contraction phase. But the luminosity, but the OB star has a radius of like 10 to 20 solar radio and a luminosity of a few times 10 to the 5. Yeah, but the, so this because yeah, this is too high. But the thing is, in the bloated phase, you expect the, the radius to be very high. In the theoretical predictions, also, the period for a 10 solar mass star could be 100 solar radius or more than that. And like considering the mass of the star is 30 solar mass, the radius could be like 500 or 600 radius. So it is consistent with the with the bloating phase of the massive star. Because in the bloating phase, you get like an expected higher radius, but the luminosity is almost the same because it is just before the star contracts in the main secret secretion phase. I, I don't think that's consistent with Stephen Bolt's number. Carry on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So other possible explanation for the for the variability in the source. So stellar rotation could also produce like periodic variability in the sources by modulating the stellar spots in the stellar surface. So, but the the, the usual period you obtain from the stellar rotation is like under 100 uh, days, 50 days or something like that. Getting that period of 200 and 300 days from the stellar rotation is very, very uh, highly improbable. And also this stellar rotation causes the slope in the CMD as positive, not the negative. So it is not consistent with the, the validity observed in our source. Uh, variation in the light of site extension could also produce periodic variability, variability in the source. But similarly, the variation in the light of site extension produces the positive slope in the CMD, but we got negative slope in the CMD. So it is not also consistent with the with our, our uh, your source. But uh, third thing is variation in the mass accretion rate. So interaction with the closed binary and the gravitational instability in the accretion days could produce mass variation in the mass accretion rate. That could reflect as a periodic, periodic variability in the, in the massive MOI source. In some of the MOI source, it has been attributed as a plausible explanation for the periodic variability. So this scenario could not be disregarded. So this is a possible plausible explanation for the variability of uh, explaining the variability in this source. And so to, to uh, uh, check the feasibility of this plausible explanation, we need to perform a, a spectroscopic time series analysis to examine the accretion pressure in the spectra, like the, the combination lines, so we can get an idea about the variation in mark accretion rate. We also need to perform the variability study of this source in NR wavelength as well. To, uh, to further verify the period obtained in the in the optical study, so this is about the uh, the work uh, the the variability work which tests the rotated star hypothesis in this source, and uh, we also we are also following this source with the ALMA. So some of the results with the ALMA, I'm going to show some of the results from the ALMA study in the next slide. So. So the source has been observed from ALMA in C436 configuration in band six. So here is the uh, the 1.3 millimeter continuum image of the target. So you can see uh, the mean size of target is 0.18 arc second to 0.13 arc second, and you can see like a spiral kind of structure and the 
multiple fragment in, in, in this structure. So this kind of spiral structure and the fragments are attributed due to the gravitational instability in the disk or something like that. And this looks a bit similar to the this kind of spiral structure uh, uh, obtained uh, in the simulation of Oliva and Kuiper 2020. So this is about the the continuum image, continuum image of the target, particularly this this compact structure, which is quite quite looks very interesting. And this is the moment one map of the 18 CO. So you can see uh, the direct contours here shows the the continuum emission. And you can see a, a velocity gradient around this, this structure. It could be due to the rotation of the structure or something. And we also, I'm also showing the moment two map of the 18 CO. So you can see high velocity dispersion, particularly <laughs> in the, this spiral kind of structure. Here you can see high, high velocity dispersion here and here. So this is about the moment one map and moment two map. And this is the channel map of the NCO. So here I've shown the channel map of the NTC. This, these two are the similar images, but this is shown with the quantum, this is shown with color diagram. So with the uh center, you can see the, uh, the quantum emission, and you can see like very filamentary kind of structure in the in the uh, in the, in the in the channel map. So we are still analyzing the, the data from the arm of this source. The, so the work is still in the program, progress. So here is the summary of, of, of my talk. So I discussed the rotate phase of the MI source along with the result obtained from a recent study, which test the rotate, uh, rotate star hypothesis in MISO of pi uh, 19520. This is the first time that a rotate star candidate has been tested for the theoretically predicted periodic variability. We find that the observed vari uh, periodic variability, the observed color trend, and the nature of the variability in uh, uh, I19520 are consistent with the pulsation model, model for a rotate MISO. This study can work as a supporting observational set of evidence for the pulsation model describing the rotate phase of MISOs. And our result strengthens the rotated star hypothesis for um, pi 19520. I have shown some of the initial preliminary images from the PRM analysis. So the spiral kind of structure associated with the, with the target. So this is about the summary. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is it possible that maybe the probability could be also caused by a companion that is hidden? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a, that's a I mean, plausibility I discussed in the slide also. And it's it's quite plausible because in the high master star formation, the probability of getting a companion is very high. So it's a, it's, it is a plausibility. Yeah. Very high, highly plausible. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I'll ask a different question. How how um how accurately is the distance to this source now? Well, it's it's actually uh, because the optical counterpart of the source is also somewhere between with the guys between eight to nine kpc, and the kinematic distance of the source with the with the uh, with the with the line emission is also somewhere between eight to nine kpc. Is because uh, yeah because parallax and the kinematic yeah yeah this is quite a distance yeah. 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 So it's, sorry, it's a long way away. So yeah, I mentioned yeah. the, the errors are quite large. Yeah, it could be large, yeah. That's true. And the luminosity that you luminosity have, uh, is, depends entirely on the distance. Yeah, it's, it depends on the distance. So with the SCD analysis, the luminosity is in our paper also, the luminosity is 10 to the power 5. Mm -hmm. And in other works, like the Lumstein at all I mentioned, this luminosity is somewhere like and the uh, Rakesh, one request from the uh, Zoom audience. Could you please switch to your conclusion slide while you're uh, answering questions? Thank you.
Oh. It's a bit strange that you can see the source in the optical. My recollection is that I have sources in general because they have such a large infrared emission mm -hmm. is because you have dust that absorb the optical. Mm -hmm. So is that okay or? or yeah, in some of the MOSOs we have seen the optical counterpart. I know some of the candidates. And basically uh, one of the explanation is, is like if you have like some cavity in the envelope or something kind of that and it is aligned towards the line of sight of yours. So it could be visible in the optical level. And another argument is that if the source is in the low metallicity environment and you have low dust to gas ratio, so the source could be visible in the optical mm -hmm. region. Uh, so in some of the sources, in, in lower mass, mass, mass regime, we have seen many sources which are visible in the optical region. But in the higher mass regime also, I have seen some, we have seen some sources which are visible in the optical region. So yeah, it's... it's yeah. yeah, the optical is very powerful. It, you, you haven't shown that there's a picture image where there's a portion. Yeah. We assume it's probably uh, driven by this source and it's quite far away, so it's the, the, the output is quite far also. So it could uh, yeah. generate they, this. Yeah. There are some like sources which are still accurate and are visible in the optical region. Very few, not much. But there are some sources there which are visible in the optical region. Thank you. So I still. How, how do they know it's an eight, nine type star? You mentioned that the source is like assigned or classified as a lady type star. Yeah, yeah. With the, with the spectrum of the source? Because I computed the luminosity. Yeah, yeah. Stefan yeah. Bosan is two, two and a half million degrees. Yes. Yeah. So, yes, for that radius, in temperature, Kelvin. Yeah, what, what's the temperature of this, the effective temperature of the salt? Yeah, considering the O9 and B1 spectral type. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is where we're all confused. Yeah, yeah. It, it should be, if it's O9 or B0, it should be 20,000, 25,000 Kelvin. But if it's, if it's got a, a 10 to the 5 solar luminosity and it's got a radius of hundreds of solar luminosities, then its effective temperature must be similar to the sun. Right, because yeah, it's been the been luminosity been to show the units is what they are squared yeah. according to your what you say. Mm -hmm. So that's completely inconsistent with it being a spectrum. Yeah, something star. doesn't fit. <laughs> that's that's be your, uh, yeah. So it's not a star if it's that bloated. That's I think Maybe our the, argument. Uh, yeah, the, the, I don't think it's bloated up to nine hundred. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, the radius but could be like see. overestimated. The lower one is like six thousand solar radius. But the theoretical prediction says that like for a 10 mass solar mass star, the radius could be a 100 solar radius. So, so that, that so could, could be for a very cool star, yeah, that's, not for that's a big... Before it gets to the classification of O or B. Yeah, yeah. that's when it's still a sort of uh, classified as a G, whatever, or an F. Yeah, that's the thing we should be... But if you have an optical spectrum, you see features of that. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely. what I understood. Of. Yeah, because the optical counter, the spectra says it, the, it is like fairly, right? Like fairly hot star with the spectral type of B1 or it's like confusing, like over O9 to B1 could be B1 or B1, but it is with the spectra of results. So the spectral type is like quite constrained, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. so we should dodge it. You can't. Yeah. 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 Okay, so. I I just have one question. So, is there any way you can estimate the mass of the disk with the Alma data? Yeah, we can estimate the mass of the disk with the continuation. Yeah, we can estimate the mass. Yeah, and our, the next step would be trying to infer the mass accretion rate with yeah, the Alma data and see if it's actually a pretty such high accretion rate yeah. should be if it's really being known. Yeah. Because I am more interested, like uh, one of the reasons he told, like about the periodic accretion variability. So, what would be the main driving mechanism between that periodic accretion variability? So I am more interested. In it could one. be a binary counterpart, 
And also, like if you have like fragments in the accretion disk, the absorption of these fragments could produce like episodic accretion and could produce like the change in mass accretion like the source. So, you so then the question is when in which time scales the disk will just will be completely eaten by the no, it's not the uh, disk, it's about the fragment. No, but okay. yeah, I, I don't know anything about this. Is it really expected that when periodicity is due to accretion, it is so periodic? I'm surprised that it accretes with the periodicity. But maybe there are theoretical explanations to it. Yeah, when they like. In, the, in their model analysis model, they took the these, these models of the Oskawa et al. and then they performed the linear stability analysis. So with that fitting the they, they found like the like the instability strip and they when they fit it with the with the peer relation, they found that relation. With that relation, they got these relations depending on the like the mass equation radius and uh, mass of the star depending on the period of the source. So it comes from the theoretical, like doing the. Yeah, all I'm this. surprised. I would yeah. expect yeah. pulsational periodicity is kind of easier to understand. That's what I have to find. It's also the equations and stuff. Maybe at this, maybe at that. The equation light sets and then the atmosphere is, is oh. very good. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes, yeah. Yeah. that's right. So that's right. It's Poseidon and Mike and Myra very yeah. Yeah. Yes, like <laughs> which is an argument that it's not can't be an OB stuff. Because the density, you can infer the density from the time scale of the Poseidon. Mm -hmm. So it's been very low, like a big jump, like a big jump. Mm -hmm. But that's true, but uh, it was also like in our mind, so the light curve doesn't resemble to a to mere type stuff. Mira type of star you see like very very what do you say very smooth light curve. You don't see like small still scale perturbation in the in the light curves. But in our light curve we see like small scale perturbations in, in a superimposed upon light curve. So it is a bit different than the light curves yeah. of the mirror type of stars. Yeah, but forgetting the details, just the, the period of the full size you the light to the one of the the square of the density mm -hmm. of the star, and if you look that length and that time scale, it comes out with this very, very low density, mm -hmm. similar to the great jump. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's well. Yeah, yeah, that would be. Yeah, yeah that's it's a very weird object. Okay, if you don't have more questions or are there questions in the online? Or that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I, I don't see any raised hands here, so I guess we don't have any questions. Okay. So yeah. next time. Um, right. Thank you. Very much.